So good evening, my name is Oliver Till and <coughs> The title of this lecture is uh, IKEA Classicism, but uh, uh, before I would like really to start the lecture, I would just say a few words about uh, our office and our, let's say, personal uh, background. Uh, let's say both partners from Atelier Kempetil are coming from uh, the East Block, and uh, the East Block is actually in that way a sort of interesting uh, uh, territory because of the fact that in the in the past uh, architecture was always be a part of the agenda of the communists. Uh, when we were uh, young, that we found later out, we both stayed with our parents in this beautiful hotel in the in the in the north of Germany. I stayed in the left one, and Andre stayed in the right one. And um, the interesting thing about the, uh, the architecture in the, in the East Block was that um, architecture was always seen as a mean to produce a better life, a better society somehow. And uh, they always tried to do their best, let's say. And uh, this trial was always related to uh, the use of uh, certain technology. And when we grow up basically in the, in the 70s and 80s, uh, in the East, there was a very strong belief in uh, prefabrication. So uh, everything uh, was related to the use of uh, panel uh, technology. And what they actually basically did, they used the same uh, technology, technology not only just for, let's say, to build factory or houses, but also holiday estate and so on. And uh, um, let's say the dream of uh, building up a new society was always related to, to this kind of belief in technology. But it was not only, uh, let's say, a technocratic thing, there was also a sort of uh, uh, belief in uh, trying to realize a certain beauty with this kind of technology. And let's say when we grow up, I mean, at a certain moment, you, we were, let's say, very doubtful about this kind of approach, but uh, to be honest, let's say 20 years later, uh, let's say we recognize that we are nowadays not so far away from this kind of way of thinking. Uh, we started both to study in the 90s in uh, Dresden in uh, East Germany, what at that time became part of the bigger Germany, but we had also the chance to study abroad, so we spent the time in, in Paris and in Japan, and it also somehow influenced uh, our way of thinking. When we, uh, let's say, finished our studies, that was in 1996, that was basically, we were basically confronted with the situation that there was no work anymore in the, in the eastern part of Germany. So we thought about uh, uh, looking for a place where there would be more opportunities uh, for young architects and maybe also to start an office. And we, uh, decided actually uh, for the Netherlands because at that, let's say, moment in the 90s in Holland there was, let's say, a nearly unbelievable uh, situation for uh, architecture in general, but also very good uh, starting condition for young office because there was a sort of belief in uh, the skills of uh, young architects. There was a belief in naivety and the belief in uh, experiment. And that now is, let's say, uh, completely gone. But I think uh, at that moment, it was the perfect breeding ground to uh, start an own uh, career. So we set up an office and we, let's say, choose the vanilla factory as a sort of place for our office. And that we did because of the fact that we think uh, this is the best building that's the best building built in the 20th century in the in the Netherlands. And it's always, <coughs> you will see that later, also related to our way of working. So whenever there's a client that comes to our office, we first show the factory, and then it's actually quite clear already a bit what, let's say, or our uh, our proposals are, let's say, already a bit more clear to the, to the client. At the moment, we work with about uh, 20 people in... Uh, in, in our office and uh, about our structure, I would like to say just a few things. Huh? Uh, 
um, I think one uh, important thing to notice is that we, let's say, see ourselves as a European office. That means that started started already in the in, at the beginning of the office that we thought it's not a good thing just to trust in one country. It's much better to spread because, uh, as you all know, economy is quite weak, and when you work in different places, you might be a little bit more stable. So we started immediately from the beginning to try to find uh, a work outside the Netherlands. And we also decided not to specialize because we think specialization is somehow quite dangerous uh, for, for an architect because when your market collapsed, for instance, when you work basically in the housing market or so on, and housing market is not working anymore, then you have a serious problem. So we try to be quite open and uh, work on uh, a relatively different uh, uh, working fields. Um, the office is structured in a way that we have a lot of uh, employees from abroad. We are uh, in the moment with eight people from eight nations and that allows us also to, uh, let's say, uh, work in different places. Uh, at the moment we're working in uh, uh, six countries and I think the amount of countries is actually grow growing because we get a lot of reactions from abroad and so we expect that that will become more in the in the next years. Uh, when we started, we were a little bit confronted because we came from the east, eh, that we had not really a sort of uh, network in the Netherlands, so we had no uncle working for a big bank or for a builder who, let's say, could give us from time to time a commission. So we were actually very much focusing on the, the uh, academic world, and we were very much related to to this kind of, let's say, to, to the network of universities and so on. And from time to time, we can generate, let's say, work via this kind of connections. When we work abroad, we always work with uh, joint ventures with a local office because of the fact that we think it's always interesting to have a local partner because he helps us as a sort of translator to understand the local conditions uh, better. The office is structured in a way that we uh, actually very much depend on the uh, competition uh, system. So we worked in the last 12 years on 150, nearly 150 projects. And of the 150 projects on 90 uh, competitions. And what we always try to do is to be part of the, let's say, invited competitions, because when you participate in invited competitions, your chance that you might win or, let's say, higher. And we have somehow a score between, let's say, every fifth or fourth uh, competition we participate, we win. And uh, out of uh, three one-in competitions, we try to build two. And uh, by that, we create, I think, nearly 90% of the annual turnover, let's say, via this kind of uh, system. So it's very much related to the culture of European uh, tendering. Um, when we started um, uh, the office, one thing that, let's say, irritated us quite a lot was that whenever you talk about uh, architecture, you mostly talk nowadays about very uh, specific um, articulations of, uh, uh, let's say, architecture. So you very much, very often talk about exceptional structures, you talk about icons, you talk about the museum as the, let's say, uh, church of the 20th century and let's say when you start your business you find actually quickly out that it's very difficult to get a job for a museum or it's difficult to get a, a, a job for an important building because uh, the work of the architect is very often just related to uh, the production of uh, grey, cheap, vulgar, generic structures. So and a lot of architects are very let's say, disappointed about this kind of situation but we said and may, we, we always thought that it is also a little bit strange just to focus as a, pro, a profession on these kind of 5%. So we said maybe uh, there might be, it might also be possible to see within these 95% something, eh? because you could say this 95% is reality and the rest is maybe not really reality. And uh, already from the beginning we said, uh, somehow we should accept the condition of the grayness, we should accept the wish of the clients to produce neutral, uh, generic, flexible uh, structures, but uh, maybe it's possible 
to find within this kind of condition still a certain uh, uh, beauty. So we came up with the idea to generate an, an architecture that we call, uh, let's say, uh, or where we think that the architecture is somehow related to the term specific neutrality. That means um, we try to accept the neutrality as a sort of economic uh, condition of uh, capitalism and try to, let's say, find within these conditions the possibilities for a certain uh, uh, beauty. And by that we focus very much in our work on, on uh, uh, three things. It's basically the uh, quality of the skin, the quality of the space and the articulation of uh, certain types. And I just would quickly show you uh, some, uh, let's say, examples about what I mean. When we started the office in 2002, we did a research about, let's say, neutral city buildings, where we thought it might be really interesting to generate a building that basically just consists out of a sort of infrastructure, but the infrastructure in itself could be already seen as architecture. So the architecture would be the gray things on the left hand side. And then this architecture could offer, let's say, certain forms of occupation. So that means you make a structure very neutral and people basically could just occupy the structure for different uses. Um, I think that is also somehow something what we learned from the past because uh, I think as a profession it's always interesting that we have, let's say, the, we, we are actually in the lucky position that we belong to a sort of profession that already exists since 5,000 years. And the question is always what can you learn from this kind of uh, history? And we believe very much that, uh, let's say, when you talk about architectural parameters, that there are basically two parameters that are the most important one. So we don't believe in the program. We think it's a sort of big mistake to base a, a, a design on, on a certain way of using a building. We also believe very much in the user because we know that the users very often quickly disappear. So we had already, uh, let's say, projects. When you finish the project, the user is not there anymore. We don't believe very much in the interior because the interior is a vague part of architecture, mostly disappears after 10 years. Huh? And also things like ornament, detail, style, and so on are not so important that, can, that you can really learn when you go to, to, to see the, the, the buildings in Rome. And we, we think that uh, the, the best thing uh, an architect can give to a building are two things. It's on one hand a strong uh, structure that allows different ways of use and a certain articulation of the space that inspires people. And uh, just to illustrate it a little bit in our way of working, this is uh, the, actually the, the, the starting point of the office was the winning entry for the European competition in 1990, where we uh, basically proposed to make apartments that are offering a sort of uh, uh, spatial condition with uh, the cityscape on the right hand side and the little green courtyard on the left hand side and the, the, the apartments are let's say basically floors and you can live in this kind of structures in different ways. You can use it as a loft but you can also let's say live in a conventional way inside these uh, structures. Um, we believe very much in, in a, a in the slowness of our of our profession because of the belief in this kind of 5,000 years uh, history. And we see ourselves very much as a uh, European architect in the, in the, in the tradition of uh, Western uh, architecture. We, very much, we are very much inspired by, let's say, this kind of uh, uh, architects. And what fascinates us always very much is that when you, let's say, these names in a row, then you quickly find out that they, all these architects learned somehow uh, from each other. So that means they accepted somehow the slowness of the, of the profession and try to use the knowledge of the previous uh, generation in their uh, uh, own work. We think that the, uh, when you look back on, on uh, 
West European architecture that uh, the uh, history of classicism and rationalism is somehow uh, the most dominant uh, tradition and this kind of tradition is in its essence uh, uh, European. So we always ask ourselves what, uh, let's say, does this kind of tradition means in the 21st uh, century? So we yeah, always try to, to play around with this kind of <coughs> uh, uh, thing and I just quickly would like to show you uh, uh, two uh, projects. One is uh, uh, a project we a project proposal uh, for an art festival in Japan in 2004, where we let's say uh, we're referring to the tradition of the dome, a very European thing, and we propose to make a dome out of acrylic. And the, the interesting thing about that was that you try to realize uh, quite a big span with let's say, by using this uh, technology in that, um, let's say, with this proposal, we propose to make a dome of like 20 meters. And uh, we proposed a dome that, uh, let's say, would be completely transparent. That means when you would imagine to enter into the inside of this structure, then the architecture is somehow disappearing and just basically, you can just only feel the architecture because of the light reflection and the change of the climate. And uh, another example I would like to show is a little building we realized uh, two years ago in the uh, city center of Rotterdam where we proposed to uh, realize a piece of, uh, you can call that urban uh, furniture that can be used as a sort of uh, uh, theater in uh, public space and building is like 40 meters long and six meter high and you can close off the, the, the structure completely with a, a theater curtain. Uh, when, you <coughs> when I talk about uh, classicism, I don't talk so much about uh, uh, style and order and this kind of thing. So we don't believe very much in Cirillo or Vignola or this kind of people. What we, what we believe in is that when you look at, on uh, architectural parameters, then uh, you can see that, uh, let's say, our profession is very much based uh, on the fact that we uh, work on basis of logic. So that means it's very much related to geometry and mathematics. Uh, we still believe that uh, symmetry and proportional systems are uh, relevant uh, for our daily work. Also because of the fact, I mean, there are people that say this is not relevant anymore in the 20 and 21st century, but we believe that actually quite a lot because when you look on development of human uh, beings in the last 5,000 years, according to Darwin, nearly nothing changed. So we are still, let's say, the same as the, as the Romans. And uh, we believe very much in, in uh, uh, monumentality because we think that you need to realize a certain uh, 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 monumentality to make buildings that are, let's say, attractive, that are, uh, that are buildings that you, where you would longer stay inside. And let's say when you use this kind of criteria, you quickly come up in focusing on uh, the, the wish to realize certain harmony, to work on uh, a rational basis, and you also, by doing that, start to create uh, personal uh, prototypes. And these are just, let's say, some of our, uh, let's say, favorite uh, typologies we worked in the last year. So we are quite fascinated by uh, courtyard types. We have certain interest that is, is the raw in the middle on uh, buildings with a central atrium in the middle. And we are also quite interested in uh, uh, buildings that basically consist just out of one space with a dialogue between uh, let's say, outside appearance and the quality of the space inside. And I'll just show you quickly some uh, prototypical, prototypical uh, uh, example. This is uh, uh, one of our earliest uh, uh, housing projects in the Netherlands. We had you basically to deal with the tradition of the door zone voning. That's something typical for Holland. And we try to let's say, show somehow uh, the logic of this typology and try to find a sort of update that would be, or that we consider relevant for the 21st century. 
And the second thing I would like to show is a project we are currently working on in uh, Morocco, uh, where we, uh, let's say, dealing with the uh, tradition of the Riyadh. So we try to make a building with a courtyard in the middle and organize all, <coughs> let's say, spaces around the space and try to find a sort of new way with uh, dealing with uh, the tradition of Islamic uh, architecture. Uh, we think, uh, let's say, one of the important differences with the past is that we live nowadays in a sort of uh, uh, mass society, and we think that uh, whenever you uh, realize a, a public building, it is basically about celebrating uh, the fact that the building is uh, public. Yeah? That is something which we should never forgotten when you, when you do something like this. And then there's always the question, how can you celebrate uh, the public uh, character of, of a building? And uh, let's say we uh, always think that you should, let's say, think about uh, 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 monumentality and, uh, and that you can especially do when you, when you articulate uh, the public elements of the structure in itself. So we, let's say, that was something what we learned when you, when you look on people like Boulay, Schinkel, Lachens, or Mies, or Louis Kahn, huh? that uh, they were always focusing, whenever they made a public building on the, let's say, articulation of the public elements, and they were always focusing to realize a sort of uh, oversized uh, spaces, that means uh, spaces that are, let's say, bigger than you would expect, and by that, yeah, you can offer quite... Uh, convenient uh, places for the audience and realize also spaces that allow different kind of use. And I just show you quickly some examples. So this is, let's say, uh, a project proposal we did for the uh, center of uh, John Paul II in uh, Krakow in, in, in Poland, where we basically tried to realize a sort of outside amphitheater for uh, church service on the scale of a sort of uh, Rolling Stones uh, concert. And uh, the second pro uh, uh, thing I would like to show is a, um, a project we are at the moment working on. It's the Space of Silent project in the uh, Antwerp city center where we basically propose to restore the existing uh, uh, concert hall without dividing the building into smaller spaces. So we ch actually basically saved the monumentality of the of the structure, and we try try it at the moment to transform it into a sort of uh, uh, cultural uh, uh, center for the local community. And the uh, last thing I would like to show in relation with that topic is an exhibition pavilion we designed in 2003 in Germany. And this is just a detail where you see the entrance doors to the pavilion, they are four meter high, and by that you somehow celebrate the fact that you go from the inside to the outside, or from, from the outside to the inside, and you, let's say, mark somehow the border of the, of the building. Um, when, we, uh, when we started the office, we uh, quickly found out that the possibilities we have as architects are actually very limited. Huh? Because as I already said, eh, the most of the work we do is related to gray uh, production and that means also that you have very often to work with uh, uh, tight uh, budgets. And what we, let's say, by thinking about that uh, recognized is that in the uh, perception of the, of the modern movement, there is very often uh, a sort of uh, misunderstanding in a way that modernism is always presented as a certain freedom and uh, free choice and so on. But we think that is not really the case. We think that, let's say, when you, when you look back on the last 200 years of uh, capitalism, you can also see a sort of change of, uh, uh, of the architecture. And our point is, let's say, that the, the architecture of capitalism is basically an architecture of uh, uh, saving. So when you look back on, the, on 200 years of uh, modern architecture, you see that the 
uh, inventions uh, architects did were mostly related to the fact that you try to save somewhere money to be able to do at a certain uh, thing a little bit more. But uh, by that, I think the, the average amount of um, money per square meter, we, we, let's say we have went more and more uh, down. And I think we are now really at the point where uh, whenever we make a building, the only thing we can do is to uh, offer a certain uh, infrastructure, but we are not able anymore to realize something what we call in German Gesamtkunstwerk or something like that. Uh, that's, I think, not uh, possible anymore. And from that point of view, I think the discussion about minimalism is always, I think, from our point of view, a little bit ridiculous because we think that that's actually not really a choice huh, to work uh, minimalistic or not. I think we all have to do it because it's the only way to get something done. And I just show quickly uh, some things, what it means from our point of view. So this is a, a housing project in the north of Netherlands where we realized a big atrium in a sort of uh, quite modernistic manner, but it was only possible by the use of quite uh, cheap materials because otherwise we had never ever be able to do something like that. This is another uh, uh, example. It's a little community center we built in, in Amsterdam. And here we were also confronted with the fact that there was hardly any kind of money to do it. And the only thing how we could manage at the end was to use a sort of uh, polyurethane uh, spray uh, insulation on the upper part of the building. It costs like 50 euro per square meter. It's normally used to insulate uh, stables for pigs. But uh, it was the only way to get this kind of uh, public facility done. And uh, the last example I would like to show is a building we are working, uh, currently working on in, in Genk. It's a building for the Kau Leuven, where we make an office building with a super efficient uh, uh, typology. It's an office building with a, a, let's say, depth of nearly 60, meter, 60 meters, with a hall in the middle. And it's actually the only way to get the building realized within, uh, let's say, very uh, limited economical conditions. So I think <coughs> one thing what we found out in the last uh, um, 12 years was uh, that we have to somehow accept the rules of uh, uh, economy when we want to build something. Eh? So whenever you do it, you have to be very clear about that. But on the other hand, we also realized, okay, as a profession, let's say we are part of a certain uh, uh, tradition. We are Europeans, we live in European city. And the question is a bit how, let's say, these two things come together. How, let's say, uh, uh, are the two things uh, related? And we think uh, that that's why we always come up with the idea of these kind of IKEA classicism that is somehow something what is going on. So on one hand, we have to continue with the tradition we have, mainly the classicism, but on the other hand, we have to accept that things become uh, cheaper and cheaper. Uh, I would like to show now uh, uh, five uh, projects that are somehow uh, uh, typical for our way of working. And uh, the presentation is actually set up in, in quite a simple way. So I start with uh, 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 pavilion things. Let's say our project we did quite often in the past. I would like to show one low-rise housing project and one high-rise housing project, then a refurbishment, and at the end, uh, public building. When we uh, started the office in uh, uh, 2000. We were actually in the lucky position that we uh, <coughs> had already a commission when we started the office for 30 houses in, in Amsterdam. But, uh, and the idea was to start immediately with the project in 2000 and the project should be finished in 2003. But uh, then when we started the, the office two weeks later, the client called and said, oh, it will be, uh, there's a little bit uh, delay it will take a little bit longer, and at the, at the end it took us eight years to finish the, uh, the structure, uh, the, the building. And uh, so we started and had basically nothing to do, so we thought, okay, what can you do? And the only thing what we, let's say, uh, what you can do as a young architect is just to try to participate in, in uh, 
competitions to find work. And we saw a competition announced by the BNR, that's the uh, Dutch Society of uh, Architects. And they uh, organized a competition to build a little public structure of about uh, 50,000 euros. And we said, okay, we will not participate because of the fact that we thought when you do a building for 50,000 euro, then you know that your honorarium is uh, super limited, so you can never ever survive. But somehow we were also inspired because we thought, okay, to make for 50,000 euro a public building, I mean, that's not possible, it's a bit ridic ridiculous and so on. And, but at the end we um, uh, participated and the project became somehow, let's say, one of the, let's say, first where we're just dealing with this kind of pavilion uh, issue and let's say when we started to think about the uh, the um, uh, commission we recognized or the, 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 the competition we, we recognized that it would be impossible to realize with a sort of conventional building technology uh, uh, public building for 50,000 euros so we're just uh, uh, joking around so we think joking around is always important to to uh, come up with ideas and we were joking around and thought yeah, maybe we could make a building with uh, uh, beer crates because uh, let's say when you come from Germany and you go to and you live in the Netherlands you recognize that the uh, Dutch beer crates look quite different than the German ones and uh, yeah we discovered that the Dutch the Dutch ones are let's say more much more beautiful than the German ones because the Dutch ones they are let's say have closed uh, uh, side uh, surfaces and have actually quite nice uh, uh, proportions. The only problem that they have that they are mostly green with a sort of Heineken sticker on or something like that and that we didn't like but we thought maybe we could do something with these kind of crates and um, um, we found out the company that is producing these kind of crates. We called them and said, maybe we just ask him, hey, is it possible for you to make a translucent uh, beer crate? So we had a bit the idea to, that it might be possible to make a beer crate that is really like acrylic, where you can really look through. And then he said, no, it's not possible. But they were also somehow, let's say, interested in, in, in our proposal. And they said, yeah, the only thing what we can offer you is to make, a, uh, to send you a white beer crate because the material that is normally used in the crates is always white and we add, add just basically a, a color and they sent us these kind of crates, they came to the office and then we were, let's say, quite amazed because the material is super thin and when you stack the crates you recognize that you can realize a wall where light is falling uh, through. And we said this is really a sort of quite fascinating thing, so we made a, a very simple competition uh, proposal, we said what we do is we make a building consisting just out of a wall with, uh, let's say, closed uh, uh, um, doors. And the main quality, the only quality or the two qualities the building has is that the, the space is big. And the, the other quality is that we make a wall where light falls through towards the inside. So we build a model, uh, what you can see here, with an interior space uh, like that. And then we, let's say, handed in the uh, competition and then uh, a couple of weeks later we got a call that we received the second prize and everybody was happy to announce us that. We were actually quite pissed because we thought second prize is always quite stupid because you have to win, eh? because when you win then you build it, but second prize is, means mostly that you are just a loser like the other uh, participants. And, um, and the winner was... Uh, a little bit stylish uh, pavilion with round uh, corners that was at that time uh, very hip. And we were a bit, let's say, disappointed, but uh, then we were actually in the lucky position that a half year later, these guys uh, called from a, a, let's say, Dutch theater festival. They had somehow seen the proposal and said, we like your uh, pavilion, maybe you can uh, build it for our theater festival. So we started to work on the design, so we received the DXF files from the from the company and thought about a certain way to uh, realize uh, prefab uh, uh, elements because they demanded the structure should be, let's say, built up in one day and also demolished within uh, one day. So we set up a, a, a system based on stacked uh, crates with some uh, metal inside. It looks already a little bit like, uh, uh, let's say, concrete uh, construction and then we 
let's say, set up a wall construction with a tent uh, foundation with, uh, let's say, uh, some anchors that you can, let's say, press into the ground and then we st uh, just uh, stack the elements and you uh, pre-stress uh, the wall. And we made uh, construction drawings for the uh, builder just to explain them how they should build up the structure. And this is already a, a photo of the uh, first side where they build up the structure. And here you see the uh, finished uh, Pavilion, and the interesting thing was the the, the quality of the uh, interior. It was actually the first time that the term uh, specific neutrality came up because actually it was a very uh, simple uh, structure, but uh, it was just basically inspiring because of the quality uh, of the light. And what you liked very much that this was a building without a uh, program. So the building is now in use since, I think, uh, yeah, 10 years. And uh, in the past, they have used the building for different uh, functions like museum, bar, discotheque, cinema, and so on. And we thought that's actually quite a nice way of making architecture. So you just make a building and then you just see how people, uh, let's say, will use the structure. And here you see an image of the, the wall. And what we also learned is that uh, um, it's always, let's say, uh, uh, difficult. When you, whenever you do a building, you have to communicate with, uh, let's say, different uh, parties. And in that way, we, as I already said, we explained the, the builder very well how they had to build up and demolish the, the, the uh, building. But you also recognize that uh, Sometimes things goes wrong, yeah? and uh, that was at the, let's say, the second site where we built the structure that uh, during the demolishing uh, procedure of the building, the, the, the builders forgot the uh, supporting uh, construction to keep the wall stable so the building collapsed. And uh, it was a picture that was uh, published in all Dutch newspapers. And uh, it was actually <laughs> quite a good advertisement for our office because even 10 years later, still clients remember. Okay. Um, the next thing I would like to show is actually quite a typical uh, 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 Dutch um, uh, project. It's a project for... Uh, uh, terraced uh, houses in, in Amsterdam and in the last uh, uh, 12 years we have been working on uh, quite, uh, uh, let's say, some of these kind of uh, projects because it used to be very uh, normal. The, the, the Dutch love this kind of way in living in, in uh, uh, raw houses and while uh, Working on these um, projects, we, let's say, developed a, a certain strategy to tackle these type of commissions. So what we mostly do is, for cost reasons, that we try to work with relatively uh, reduced uh, spans. So we always try, when we can, to make relatively thin uh, houses with a relatively deep uh, plan and uh, because of the first two steps when you, when you can do the first two steps then you create already quite good uh, 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 economical uh, quite good economical uh, starting point so we have a little bit a sort of claustrophobic uh, situation as a starting point and then we uh, combine this situation on one hand with uh, adding a lot of glass and by that we get a lot of light inside the structure. And on the other hand, uh, we produce, let's say, with step one and two, quite uh, some uh, cheap uh, uh, square meters inside the structure. They cost nearly nothing. And by that uh, we can also cut them uh, out again. So we bring in voids into the structure. And by that we can find the sort of, let's say, interesting uh, balance between uh, compactness and uh, let's say, spatial uh, quality. And 
this structure is very much related also to the fact not only to the to the uh, economy but also to the fact that we have to produce uh, 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 in terms of energy structures that are let's say quite uh, compact that means with a reduced amount of uh, facade and the project I would like to show is a project in uh, Amsterdam Ostrop, the 60s uh, housing area. And uh, uh, what we actually basically did, we removed an, an apartment uh, building from the 60s and built one strip of uh, uh, terraced houses or townhouses. And uh, one of the issues where we're dealing with was the question of uh, parking because, as you might know, uh, uh, big parts of the Netherlands are below uh, uh, sea level, so also the, the Amsterdam uh, region, and uh, the ground, level, ground water, water level is just, uh, let's say, 50 centimeter below the ground, and because of that it's really difficult to build parking garages because they are much too expensive. So what we proposed here was to uh, realize a sort of drive-in uh, apartment, but we didn't put the drive-in at the front side of the house, but on the back side. So we built actually behind the strip of houses a little street of six meter with parking garages under each individual uh, house, and we covered the, the, the street with a roof with terraces. And... Uh, by that, we had already a sort of quite an interesting basis to set up uh, uh, the typology. So we said we have a sort of front garden that has a more public uh, character. So we make a, behind that, we make a, a, a living uh, kitchen with a void space related to the front garden. You make a stair going up to the first floor. You have your living room with a terrace on top of the uh, uh, parking street. And then you have on the third floor basically the con conventional program consisting out of uh, free sleeping rooms and that all within the, let's say, uh, um, uh, given four meter 80. And uh, because of the fact that we had to build for, uh, let's say, relatively little money, the project was realized for 830 euro per square meter. So that's quite low and uh, because of that we just were really trying to uh, set up a very uh, let's say rigid structure to be within a budget so you see here the, the foundation looks already a little bit from like a 60s book about housing quite a clear uh, construction system so you see the the skeleton we try to use a lot of prefabricated uh, elements because our experience is that when you use prefab, it's often cheaper than the things you do on the side and the quality is uh, better. And uh, because of the fact that we, let's say, set up quite an economic uh, system, we could afford a relatively expensive uh, uh, facade uh, system. And there's already uh, photos of the uh, finished uh, project, so you see here the 23 houses uh, behind each other, and this is the individual uh, unit. For uh, space reasons, we uh, avoided a conventional uh, door that opens towards the inside, but proposed to make a, a sliding door as an entrance. It's actually quite uh, uh, an American way of uh, entering a house. And it sounds quite easy, but in reality it was really difficult because we had to negotiate with a lot of uh, people within the uh, city of Amsterdam to get the permission to set up their houses like that. And uh, this is a, a photograph over the corner. And because of the fact that we... <coughs> had to uh, use or had to, let's say, work within a very, uh, let's say, small budget. We had to use different materials to build up the structures. So we had at the front facade a sort of aluminum facade. On the side facade we have uh, 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 steel plate and on the back side we have uh, uh, wooden windows. 
So we have actually a collage out of uh, uh, different materials because of the fact we choose just for every element uh, the cheapest uh, system. And then was a bit the question how could we bring these kind of elements together and we decided not to show the collage but bring the mat materials together by their choose, uh, by, 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 by decision to make everything white. So by that, let's say the structure still looks monolithic but in reality uh, it is not. So we had even, let's say, some money to make nice door handles and so on. This is the zone on top of the uh, of the uh, parking street. So you see the, the, the street underneath and the terraces uh, on top and then the sleeping rooms. And this is an image of an individual uh, uh, unit. Just to... <coughs> uh, be able to explain you how, let's say, complicated this is to build these kind of structures is, is the fact that uh, whenever you make a, a, a terraced house project in the Netherlands, there is never the money to, let's say, realize the separations between the private gardens uh, within the budget because of the fact that the clients always believe that... Uh, yeah, just the people, they buy a house and then the first thing what they do, they went to the building market and they buy these wooden elements and then they realize their own partition of the gardens. But we were here confront, confronted with the situation that the garden was on the basically on the first floor, so on top of the garage. And we had to find a way to realize the separation elements. And as I already said, yeah, there was hardly any money, so we just tried to find something that would be cheap, and at the end we ended up with a sort of uh, a plastic foil that we used to uh, to separate the, the houses. The foil costs uh, 250 euro uh, per piece, and that's again a sort of let's say system coming out of the uh, of the animal industry. In that case, the foil is normally used to separate uh, pigs uh, in 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 stables, but here we let's say managed to. Uh, let's say, use it in, in a project like that. It's, and the project is now finished since four years. The, the foil looks still very good, and, but it shows a little bit uh, um, yeah, that you have to be uh, very in innovative to get these kind of things uh, 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 tackled. And this is the, let's say, the most, maybe the most inspiring space in the whole thing. That's the uh, uh, collective parking garage underneath the, the uh, project and just some photos of how people live in these structures. That's uh, one of these uh, kitchens at the ground floor, the living room with the view over the terrace towards the uh, courtyard, and uh, a photo from, let's say, from the living room down towards the kitchen. <laughs> the next project I would like to show is uh, um, an apartment uh, project. In that case, a building we realized in the uh, north of the, of the Netherlands, in Zwolle. And uh, let's say what, what is the condition in the Netherlands is that uh, there uh, <coughs> still the most of the social housing is still based on, uh, let's say, gallery accessed uh, housing types. It's also something where we recognize what is now uh, hip again in Belgium. So whenever you work here for uh, social housing corporation, you're also very often confronted with uh, the fact that you have to realize these structures. And we were, let's say, wondering <coughs> how we could uh, avoid uh, these uh, typology. And what we mostly propose when we have the chance is to realize uh, buildings with a central core and then with uh, apartments uh, all around because by that you can have uh, a relatively compact uh, access zone and you can still uh, access quite a lot of uh, uh, different uh, apartments. And uh, the strategy we use normally is that we, it's a bit similar to the, to the raw house uh, strategy, that we try to make uh, a building that is as deep uh, as possible, so when we, when we can, we try to make structures with like, I don't know, 30 meters depth. We put the core uh, in the middle of the structure and we organize the apartments around uh, the core. And we try to compensate the, the little bit claustrophobic uh, condition by adding uh, a glass facade. And uh, 
again, we, uh, let's say, this is the photo I took a couple of years ago in Chandigarh, is we, let's say, we have a certain interest to, to offer um, infrastructure to the people. Huh? With infrastructure, I mean the building. And people can, let's say, occupy the structure. And we always ask ourselves how people can somehow contribute to, to the, <coughs> let's say, appearance of the, of the building. And this is the housing project in, in uh, Zwolle. Uh, so you see a compact organization. And uh, the building has, in that case, uh, yeah, a glass facade, completely all around all facades. And uh, the, 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 let's say, character of the building or the experience of the building is very much related to the fact that the building is occupied and the the builders some, uh, and, the, and the inhabitants somehow, let's say, contribute with their interiors to the experience uh, of, the, of, the, of the thing. So it's not so much about realizing a facade that is separating uh, public and private, but more uh, something like an interface so that means a sort of surface where people by themselves can uh, decide uh, about how much they want to communicate with the, with the public uh, space. The building is realized in, again in the 1960s area. And uh, the structure is set up in quite a rigid uh, uh, way. Uh, Reminds, in terms of strategy, also a little bit on uh, people like Aldo Rossi or uh, Oswald Matthias Ungers. But uh, because of the fact that, the, that we have a lot of glass, you get the, f the phenomenon that the interiors become part of the, of the expression of the building. And we, has all, we have also the fact that the facade uh, consists for 50% out of sliding elements. And by that, you get a little bit more uh, uh, playful uh, character within this kind of quite uh, rigid, uh, let's say, setup or organization of the building. And the building is actually organized uh, quite simple. So we have a sort of uh, half sunken uh, basement with uh, storage spaces. We have on uh, uh, the height of one meter fifty, uh, fifty the, the the ground floor, with uh, a double uh, entrance hall and the central core in the middle, and then we have a typical uh, floor plan with uh, eight apartments per floor, and we were here actually in the lucky position that <coughs> the building was so uh, compact and the core. Was so uh, was also quite compact organized that we that there was some space uh, over in the inside of the building so we could cut out a hole and realize an atrium that is running through the uh, through the whole building so that means you have a double high uh, entrance hall and then you walk uh, to the lift and then you are let's say confronted with the fact that there is light falling from the top all the way down. Uh, to the ground floor, and it's something what you would not expect when you see the building uh, from the outside. So this is the uh, situation when you enter the uh, entrance hall, double high space, and then you, uh, let's say, see the atrium. And uh, as I already mentioned, uh, 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 here again, we had <coughs> quite a tight budget. This project was built for 850 euro uh, 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 per, per uh, square meter. And the only way to get the work done was by uh, using uh, uh, quite cheap materials. So we said we basically we, we, we were building with concrete, but not with in situ concrete, but normal construction concrete. And we just, let's say, uh, didn't finish the wall and left the concrete <coughs> as it was. We put industrial lighting, cheap wooden doors, and galvanized uh, handrails. And uh, 
but still try to make somehow a sort of nice uh, arrangement. And we think when you see the building, it's somehow a mix between Swiss uh, art museum and uh, basement. And I think this is, I think, a typical... Uh, I, I would say this is maybe the maximum what you can reach with, uh, let's say, social housing, with this uh, economic, uh, let's say, situation. And just show you quickly uh, uh, the interior. So you have, uh, let's say, loft-like uh, 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 apartments <coughs> in social housing that so people can rent for 550 euro, uh, 100 square meter uh, apartment, which is actually quite cheap for the, the Dutch uh, situation. And we were actually very happy to, uh, let's say, <coughs> uh, realize this project because I think that is something, uh, let's say, what all of us maybe learned at the, at the uh, 20th century, that there is not really a discussion about lofts anymore. I think nearly everybody in Europe likes lofts, but the, the only question, let's say, that we are confronted is, is how can we pay or realize these kind of structures also for within... Uh, uh, social housing and uh, we got quite a lot of uh, positive response on the in the building and we are let's say currently working on let's say different uh, project with similar uh, strategies and uh, uh, one of the projects that will relatively soon be go on construction is a housing project in uh, Paris where we let's say realize two social housing blocks with a, a similar uh, strategy <coughs> uh, when we started the office, uh, we were actually quite naive. Eh? So we thought when you are an architect, you just uh, be basically busy with realizing new buildings. So we thought that when, when you are an architect, that is basically what you do. Eh? But uh, yeah, quickly we found out that... Um, when you work as an architect, you are very much confronted with the fact that you have to uh, transform or refurbish uh, existing uh, structures. And what we see now because of the economic uh, crisis in, in, in Europe and especially also in, in Holland, that the only jobs that are remain are jobs that are related to transformation. So we think because of the fact that there is no economic growth anymore, there is not much growth of... Uh, uh, population and so on we have architecture will happen within the existing and we have as a sort of a profession think more and more about uh, let's say the possibilities of uh, let's say uh, transformation so at the moment uh, uh, we are working in the office on I think 50 percent of the of the of the commissions are related to uh, refurbishment because uh, a lot of clients cannot afford anymore to realize new structures so what they do is they upgrade existing structures sometimes they do an extension and we have now already uh, let's say projects where we extend the extension or we remove the extension to make a new extension and so on so this is a thing what is let's say quite typical at the moment and in the last um, uh, uh, years we have worked on quite uh, some different uh, uh, of these uh, commissions. But the point is always a little bit that we recognize there is not really a sort of clear uh, theory about how to tackle these kind of commissions because these commissions are always very uh, specific and we always wonder a little bit if, let's say, the fact that you refurbish an, ar an, an building is really architecture. Because sometimes we think when you do a refurbishment, it's more like related to design. They are not really objective criteria anymore. And you just basically try to do something within uh, the existing. Uh, when we uh, started our office uh, uh, 12 years ago, uh, we had always the, the naive belief that uh, it would be quite sensible that we have an office in the Netherlands to work in Belgium as well, because of the fact that it's so close. Huh? And uh, we started already in uh, 2003 to enter the Belgian market, and all our Dutch colleagues 
were making a bit jokes about it because he said, yeah, you are crazy. I mean, how can you do that? <laughs> and much too complicated and so on. But we uh, somehow, I don't know, we, because of the fact that we liked, like somehow uh, uh, Bejum uh, very much, we spent a lot of time and energy to, to uh, let's say, trying to enter uh, here. And uh, it took us actually quite a while to get here our first uh, commission. So we did, I think we participated in 12 competitions before winning uh, uh, the first one. So we were actually also quite often invited to the Open Op Group, but I think we are really one of the, let's say, offices that, uh, uh, let's say, has, has a very bad score in Open Op Group. So we participated, I think, now in total 12 times, but we only won once. <laughs> Uh, and the, let's say the, the 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 first competition we won in 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 Belgium came from a completely unexpected situation because we saw a, a competition in uh, in Eupen for the Parliament of the German speaking community, a community where we quite amazed that they are existing because we were not really aware that there was also. A, uh, let's say a German uh, community in Belgium and we let's say participated in the competition and we luckily won and the competition was basically about transforming uh, an old uh, hospital uh, uh, building into into the parliament and it's I don't know if you have ever been there in Alpen the, the, the city is inside the in the in the valley and there's a little mountain and on top of the mountain there is this uh, sanatory and uh, the, the building can be relatively easy reused as a sort of office building, but there are no accommodations for the for the parliament. So the the brief asked for a sort of uh, extension, and uh, it was not an easy job because when you see the building, it's more like a autonomous object, and it's not easy to imagine how you can extend the structure. So what we proposed was to build the assembly hall in front of the of the building basically more or less in a sort of uh, uh, basement uh, situation because there is a certain uh, profile that allows to integrate the, the, the hall underneath the existing uh, building and we received the commission in 2009 and the building is now uh, on the way and will be finished in September next year and uh, what we actually did was that we here you see the the basement of the building so we put the assembly hall on the uh, basement level inside the existing uh, slope and when you enter the building on ground floor level you see uh, the roof of the structure but you enter into the main building you make a turn and then you go uh, down the building looks at the moment uh, like that. It's a building from 1915. Uh, and we have to insulate uh, uh, the structure, in that case with outside insulation. And uh, here you see the, let's say, on the left-hand side, the assembly hall as a sort of part of the of the slope and uh, let's say we were wondering when designing the structure how could we or how should we let's say articulate these the, these uh, this new structure and we thought on one hand it's belonging obviously to the building but on the other hand it's also belonging to the to the landscape and we have quite a big uh, roof um, that you can see when you enter the main building. So we came up with the idea to make a sort of a vegetation ve vegetation roof and use also the same vegetation for the for the facades. And but we thought maybe the building should not be green but should be red to be a little bit autonomous from the green around. So we tried to find out if it is possible to uh, make a vegetation facade with uh, red lands, what is in reality different. So you see here some of the uh, tryouts. And um, so we put the, 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 the assembly hall, let's say on the left hand side next to the building, we make a stair to connect the, the main building better with the uh, surrounding park. But we have also to 
let's say, restructure the existing facade. So we, we let's say, make the windows uh, bigger and we have to <coughs> insulate the building. In that case, with outside insulation was the only way to get it done because we have uh, to deal here with uh, uh, wooden floors. And uh, that was actually quite, it's actually quite uh, complicated because we have somehow uh, to destroy the existing qualities to be able to realize uh, a sustainable building. So in that case, the wish of the client. So the building is, I think, 50% below the, the Belgium norm uh, concerning energy. I think it's A40 or something, A40. And uh, yeah, and it's only possible by adding uh, 16 centimeter uh, uh, insulation and let's say uh, uh, aluminum windows with uh, triple uh, glazing. And here you see uh, the section uh, of the building. So you see the entrance zone in the middle between the assembly hall and the existing buildings. And uh, yeah, when you enter, people make a sort of turn through the building. And the, I think the, the unexpected quality is that you just enter a building, you go down into the basement, and then you go into the assembly hall, and you are confronted again uh, with the landscape. So we make a routing through the building. So you have here a staircase going, let's say, between the historic part and the new one. You come up in a, a foyer uh, space. It looks already like that, and then you enter the uh, um, assembly hall. What was interesting about the assembly hall is that the, <coughs> the building is mainly used for uh, communi communication, so that means there are, let's say, relatively high uh, demands on the uh, acoustics, but uh, the clients wished that we, uh, let's say, should work somehow with uh, local wood because they have a local wood culture there and they thought it might be interesting to do something with that. So we came up with the idea to make a space that is completely covered uh, uh, with wood, but it's not so easy, let's say, regarding the, the rules concerning acoustics. So we proposed to make an uh, acoustic uh, panel that is based on one hand on, uh, let's say, uh, a typical floor system but we uh, kept uh, a distance between the blocks and let's say these kind of things here. So they, have a, they have an acoustic function <coughs> and by that we can, let's say, absorb enough noise and are still able to use everywhere uh, the same uh, uh, material. And that's, uh, let's say, a photo of the half-finished uh, building and uh, let's say the work on the interior will start um, quite soon. Mm, the last project I would like to show is a, a public building. And uh, I think that was actually quite a, 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 an, an amazing uh, 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 thing because uh, in uh, 2004, we participated on uh, an uh, international competition in Austria to build a little uh, concert hall in uh, uh, the village where Franz Liszt was born. And uh, there were, I think, 150 entries, and we got uh, a second prize. So it was again... Uh, <laughs> not very nice, so we were really like disappointed again, uh, second prize. <laughs> and, uh, but then the client said, yeah, but when you, when you receive second pri prize, you also have to negotiate, uh, to participate at the neg 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 negotiation uh, procedure among the winners, because there might be still a little chance that you will get uh, the commission. So we had to go to Austria and uh, uh, had a talk with the client and we were actually in the lucky position that we could convince them and they gave us uh, the commission in February 2005 and then they said, yeah, you know, you will start in March and uh, we will start to build the thing in 
September. And then before the yeah, it's a joke because we, we know from Holland uh, that you need always, I don't know, two years to, to start with something. But uh, in reality, it really came out like that. So we had to, let's say, produce within four months all the uh, uh, tender documents. It was really a hell of a work. But uh, yeah, the, luckily the thing was built and already a year, a year later in 2006 the, the building was uh, finished. The project uh, is, belongs <coughs> to, to our strategy of the uh, uh, atrium uh, type. And what we actually, we, we like this type uh, quite a lot because uh, uh, this is a sort of uh, building type that can actually work quite independent from, uh, from the program. So, and we, in the past, we have, let's say, already experimented with it for schools, uh, uh, university buildings, and so on. And I think it's a, quite an interesting model for, uh, 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 to organize uh, uh, a building. Uh, the funny thing about the uh, uh, concert hall in Austria was the fact that uh, it was uh, financed by European money. The, the, uh, the place riding is close to, to the Hungarian uh, uh, border. And because of the fact that uh, the, the, the building is realized in a sort of uh, border condition, uh, they could, the client could somehow find, uh, let's say, money by the European uh, Union. And they were able to build in a village with 900 inhabitants a concert hall for 600 uh, uh, people. <laughs> And here you see the, the house of uh, the house of birth of uh, Franz Liszt, and we had let's say to add quite a substantial uh, program next to the to the house. And here you see already the implemented uh, concert hall uh, in the village between the uh, wine yards. And um, the building was really realized directly in the middle of the of the village, not let's say, related to the public space, but inside uh, a little uh, garden. And like so often in these kind of uh, uh, places, uh, we were also a sort of uh, confronted with a situation that is, I think, quite typical for these uh, commissions is that there is on one hand uh, uh, a sort of uh, ambition to realize uh, something uh, special because of the fact that the people know that's yeah, in this region, it might be the only public building that we, we build in the next 50 years. But on the other hand, uh, the uh, financial means are quite uh, uh, limited. So there is a sort of, let's say, uh, strange, uh, let's say, disbalance between uh, ambition and uh, economic uh, reality. And uh, we already tried to uh, conceptualize this kind of fact in the, in the, in the competition phase. So we, we, we basically said, okay, when you build a concert hall, you should focus on the quality of the, of the auditorium because that's the reason why people go there to listen to music. And you should try to, uh, yeah, let's say, uh, spend the biggest part of the money to realize a convincing space and the rest should be a little bit uh, cheaper just to get the structure built. And the other thing what was quite strange is that when you think about the uh, tradition of uh, uh, concert halls for classical music that this type of building is always related to the city, yeah? invented in the, in the late 18th, uh, in 18th century with highlights in the, in the 19th century. Uh, whenever you think about the concert hall, you have a sort of, you imagine a building with a clear front facade and then some side facades. But here it was not the case. You are in a village, in a garden, and we had to design a building with that more or less could equally re react to all sides because also, let's say, uh, visitors would come from uh, different directions. And what we proposed was to put the... Uh, main auditorium in the middle, it's also the highest space, and organize the foyer uh, around this uh, central hall. And that produced uh, uh, this kind of uh, section. And 
we are already in the competition thought about how we could manage within the uh, uh, given, let's say, quite uh, sharp uh, budget. And we quickly found out that we had to accept, uh, let's say, uh, the, the concrete uh, construction. And we had, also, we had also to accept the outside insulation. That is quite typical uh, for uh, that region. But we thought, I mean, it, it would be really strange to make a, a concert hall with a, a plaster facade. So we came up with the idea to use a sort of uh, plastic coating and that would allow us to make a building with a continuous uh, uh, surface with no difference between facade and roof. And we just handed in this model that already showed some of the uh, material qualities we uh, would like to uh, realize. And yeah, after we got the commission, we had really to work quite hard to get it done. And we, let's say, found a system based on uh, uh, polyurethane that we could use uh, for the facade and we set up a detail with let's say a continuous facade between uh, roof and <coughs> and facade and here you see the the uh, joints at the corners so there is no metal or something like this in between it's basically just the material fall folded 90 degrees around the building and <coughs> It looked actually quite uh, simple, but in reality it was really difficult to get uh, permission. So we had to negotiate for quite a while with the Austrian uh, authorities. So we had also to set up uh, uh, yeah, mock-ups and make tests just to get the building permissions. But we had a, a, a client who was quite uh, patient and really wanted the, the building like that. And so at the end we could manage and I think uh, one month before the execution, we got permission for the setup uh, of the wall. And then here you see just some of the photographs of the construction stage. And here you see the continuity of roof and uh, facade. The corner of the building without nearly nothing in between. Looks a bit like a, a paper model. And uh, the entrance facade of the building and the side facade. And the facade is especially uh, nice when the sun is quite low because then you get quite nice reflection or after the rain then it looks quite uh, uh, beautiful. And we choose the color white because all of the, let's say, the buildings in the neighborhood are white and we thought it might be nice relation with the strangely white church that is quite close to the concert hall. And um, another thing we were dealing with that we had this, yeah, we proposed to make this uh, uh, auditorium in the middle and the foyer around was that uh, we found out that when we would use a concrete construction, we could make a building without uh, uh, windows on the first floor and that would allow us to uh, realized quite substantial beams and we could bring in uh, big glass on the level of the of the foyers and that would allow nice views into the garden because we thought when you make a concert hall in the in a village then it's basically about the relation between inside and outside but then the the, the scale of the building was of such a kind that we have a height of uh, four meter for the glazing and a length of sometimes 18 meters. And we found out that when we would bring in a, um, conventional glass facade, we would need a secondary uh, construction, what we did not like much because by that you would divide the view again. And then we, let's say, came up with a bit uh, naive uh, proposal to use um, acrylic instead of glass because when you use acrylic, you can, uh, let's say, realize uh, uh, much bigger uh, plates and because it's a technology that comes from uh, uh, aquariums. <coughs> and, um, and we thought maybe we can use that for this kind of uh, uh, building. And in reality, it was quite difficult to get it done because um, 
the uh, material is moving quite a lot between winter and uh, uh, summer situations. So we have a movement of like six centimeters when you make a glass plate of a length of uh, 18 uh, meter. So that meant that we had to design window frames that would allow the glass plate to move inside uh, the frame. So we put a Teflon strip underneath the plate and so that the plate could move, uh, 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 let's say, a little bit. And it uh, was quite uh, mm, difficult to, uh, to uh, uh, find a company that could do the job, but at the end we find an Austrian uh, company, and then they, here you see uh, one of the first uh, windows arriving at the, at the building site, and that it, here you see the situation, how it looks when the acrylic plate is inside uh, the frame. The material is, in that case, uh, five centimeter uh, thick, so it's more like a sort of translucent wall. It's a bit, let's say, from perception point of view, different than uh, uh, glass. And um, because of the fact that we, we were using uh, fixed uh, glazing for the windows, we had to uh, realize a uh, different type of uh, uh, openings that would allow people inside the foyer to uh, enter into the garden. So we proposed to make uh, uh, moving panels of four by four uh, meter that would also fit a little bit to the local vernacular tradition of the stables. And we had in the beginning a bit the idea that we might be able to use wooden doors that you use in uh, cow stables and or something like that. But at the end it was not possible because the doors had to be insulated and we found out that cow stables are never uh, uh, insulated. So we had to design the, the doors uh, by ourselves was what, what was actually not uh, easy. So we designed at the end the sort of uh, steel frame and we cladded the doors with wood because we were not able to do that with uh, wooden construction. And here you see, uh, let's say, the corner of the building when the door is open. And here you see a little bit the scale of the door. On the right hand side, you see the uh, project leader next to the, you know, the, next to the door. And um, now here I, com I would like to come back on the issue of uh, uh, monumentality, because very often when you mention monumentality, then uh, people think about something like, uh, I don't know, Albert Speer or Soviet architecture. But uh, I think monumentality is very often also something that is necessary to just, uh, let's say, realize relaxed and uh, fluent interior. So you see here the, the, the door opening of four by uh, four meter looks very relaxed, very normal. Also when you're there, you think it's quite a normal thing. It's so convincing. And... Uh, I think it was, yeah. Uh, let's say, in terms of atmosphere, we like that uh, quite a lot. That you, uh, uh, yeah, can because we did that to to allow, let's say, a sort of fluent connection. And yeah, just to be able to do that, you need a scale like that to make it really uh, relaxed. And uh, that's a photo from the uh, outside towards the inside. You see the uh, uh, main uh, foyer, and you see a few from the foyer to the uh, house of birth of uh, Franz Liszt. So we try to present the the the, the, the house of birth on a sort of sockle of uh, grass. And, uh, we always thought that it should be that the, the birth house should be somehow part of the. Um, uh, experience of uh, going uh, to the concert and we had always the idea that because there come also a lot of uh, tourists from uh, Japan and Korea that they would enter the foyer and then they would start to cry when they see the, the uh, house of birth. And this is just some images of the first floor. And the uh, last thing I would like to show is the uh, concert hall, the auditorium itself. When we started the design, we actually found out that when you look back on uh, a 200 years tradition of uh, 
concert halls in Europe, that there is quite a big difference between concert halls built in the 19th century and built in the 20th century, because in the 19th century, uh, all what you see and all what, what the architects did is somehow the basis for the acoustic experience of the hall. And when you look on the concert halls of the 20th century, you recognize that architects came up with a sort of free organization of the space and then they put in these kind of acoustic panels. And uh, the uh, acoustic experience is very often not related really anymore to that what you see, huh? because there is a sort of difference between acoustic and architecture. And yeah, we didn't like that much, so we thought when we would build a, a concert hall, especially for a 19th century composer, it would be more interesting just to focus on, on this kind of 19th century tradition and try to set up a concert hall where, let's say, the architecture itself is uh, creating the basis for the acoustics. So we discussed quite a while with uh, our ac acoustic uh, advisor about uh, this idea and we, let's say we talked also about the length of the waves and so on and we came up with the idea to use uh, wood elements because with wood you can actually relatively easy realize spans of three, four meters and that's actually quite well related to the length of the, of the uh, waves. And uh, we set up a sort of uh, uh, Cartesian uh, space with uh, a visible uh, construction and the uh, uh, acoustic engineer calculated and said, okay, this is already quite good when you have this kind of uh, structure of the surface and you use certain proportions to get quite a good basis for the uh, uh, acoustics. And we won uh, the competition at the end basically because of the concept for the acoustics, because it's also something a bit quite typical for, for our profession, so that most of the architects forgot somehow to think about the issues, they thought about a lot of forms and so on, but not so much about, let's say, the, the, the quality uh, of the sound. But we had the problem that our uh, Dutch acoustic advisors could not get the job for the execution of the of the building. So we got a new advisor in that case, Müller Baby and from Munich. And he said, yeah, the basis is very nice, but uh, you, but the quality of the surface is not good enough. The only thing what you have to do is to uh, turn all the panels with uh, three and a half degree, and by that you get a perfect basis for, for the acoustics. And we were quite shocked about that because uh, <coughs> Uh, yeah, engineers are always so innocent that they just propose it and they think yeah, you can do it like that, but they didn't recognize that they would or that, that they would destroy our whole concept with this kind of proposal because by that you would realize a, a concert hall that looks like a fish and we, I mean, we like fishes but not in concert halls. And so we were really uh, trying to find uh, a solution of how to tackle these uh, three and a half uh, uh, degree and we developed, let's say, different uh, uh, proposals to get that done. And at the end, we came up with a sort of let's uh, let's say with with that idea. So we proposed to use a panel of a, uh, a size of 12 centimeter in the middle and use a 3D wood tool that would allow us to uh, cut the the panel at the at the edges to eight centimeters and by that we could realize the three and a half degree inside the panel and that would allow us to have everywhere the same connection joints all around the animal, uh, the element. So we used a special wood tool to get these kind of plates uh, realized. It was at that time really uh, uh, hip because it reminded a lot on an architect uh, now already nearly forgotten, called Greg Lynn, who was, let's say, one of the super avant-garde architects who used uh, 3D technology, and we had to use something like this here because uh, of this need for the acoustics. And, uh, and here you see some of the uh, pictures of the uh, execution of the, of the thing. It was quite nice to, to, let's say, work in Austria because there is still this kind of a local uh, building craft, and we try really to use that in the in the uh, in the design. 
So we could make a sort of wood de uh, detailing that, uh, let's say, uh, would be unthinkable in the in the in the in the in the Netherlands, and we could luckily find the carpenter who could really, uh, let's say, uh, manage within all these kind of complicated regulations and. Uh, yeah, at the end, uh, we were really lucky because we recognized that we, as, yeah, as professionals, are very much depending on the, on the uh, skills that are available uh, on the site. And these are, let's say, some of the images of the finished uh, concert hall. And uh, I really would like to thank you, and I hope I could convince you a little bit about, let's say, our struggle <laughs> between the forces of economy and uh, the, let's say, tradition of our profession. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs>